Well, good morning. Hi, I'm Dr. Baker, and along with several other folks, we provide medical services here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so if I haven't seen you in the medical office, we will. Uh, and we're going to take the next hour or so to talk about addiction and to try and understand what that disease is a little bit better. And as we go through this, it's sometimes helpful and sometimes easier to understand if you think of diabetes. We all know a little bit about diabetes, even if we don't have it, even if we don't have any relatives who have diabetes, we know a little bit about it. And so I would say to you, do donuts cause diabetes? Well, kind of. You know, they tell you, don't eat too damn many donuts, you're gonna get diabetes. There's a grain of truth in that. Um, but if we took 100 people coming down the street and put them in a school bus and drove them to, to Tim Hortons and kept them there for a year and gave them six donuts for breakfast, six for lunch and six for supper and all the pop they want to wash it down with, at the end of the year they'd all be fat, they'd all have zits, but only some of them would be diabetics. How come? Why wouldn't they all be diabetics? Yeah, there's this genetic predisposition. There's this something special you're born with that says if you eat six donuts a day or six donuts three times a day for a whole year, you're going to get diabetes. If we took those same 100 people and locked them in Tim Hortons, the shelves are full all the time, eat whatever you want, as much as you want, there's only one rule. We are coming back in a year, and if you're not diabetic, we're going to, we're going to shoot you and we'd have to shoot most of them because most of them could not become diabetic uh, if their lives depended on it. So we're gonna talk about addiction today and keep that in the back of your head. We're gonna talk about addiction today and sometimes I'm gonna talk about cocaine and sometimes I'm gonna talk about alcohol and sometimes I might talk about heroin. The disease is addiction. Whether you're addicted to heroin or alcohol or cocaine, what's going on inside your brain is exactly the same. You might look different, act different, and smell different, but what's going on deep inside is exactly the same. And so if I'm talking about alcohol and your drug of choice is something different, I'm talking about you as well. Uh, and if I'm talking about cocaine and you say all I do is drink, it applies to you as well. And by the end of it, you'll understand why some people like one and some people like the other. Having said that, you know, most of what we know about addiction today is thanks to cocaine. Up until just a few years ago, the major drug of addiction was alcohol. Does al is alcohol addictive? Yes. Yeah, but you know, it takes a while to get you. Most people probably start drinking when they're 14 or 15 years old, and they're probably 35 or even 40 before they end up in a treatment center like this. And we've gotten kind of used to them being assholes. You know, and there was a tendency to say, oh, he's been a jerk his whole life. Uh, useless, helpless, hopeless, write him off. He's like that. His brothers are like that. His father's like that. Uh, you know, those O'Reilly's are just useless. And there was a lot of moral judgment around alcoholism because we just got so used to people being like that. We thought they had always been like that. Along came cocaine. Cocaine wasn't new. 125 years ago, you could order cocaine from the Sears catalog. You can even order the syringes to go with it. Don't bother looking, it's not there anymore. <laughs> you used to be able to buy cocaine at the corner store, along with opium and a whole bunch of things. It's not there anymore. Um, they used to put cocaine in Coca-Cola, which is why it was Pepsi was the pause that refreshes. They still use the coca plant. The plant that's used to make cocaine is still used to make Coca-Cola, but there's no active cocaine hydrochloride anymore. They put caffeine now uh, to give you that little boost. But so cocaine kind of disappeared. In the early 1900s, we had a huge problem with addiction because you could buy cocaine at the corner store. You could buy heroin at the corner store. We had a lot of addiction. And they passed a whole bunch of laws and some drugs became illegal and others became prescription only. And so they kind of disappeared. And the major drug of addiction for a long time was alcohol. Cocaine made a comeback in the 1970s when a bunch of enterprising South Americans realized that they could export cocaine and make a lot of money. So it's 1975 and it's a Saturday night and five guys go out to try cocaine. It was a little different in 1975. Believe it or not, we used to say that cocaine was not addictive. 
That sounds like a really dumb thing to say today, but our understanding of addiction 40 years ago was not very good. We used to believe that for a drug to be addictive, it had to cause withdrawal. And so if you're drinking a 26 of vodka every day and you've been doing that long enough and you stop drinking, pretty soon you're going to start shaking. And if you've been drinking long enough, you maybe start to hear things, see things, the famous pink elephants. Uh, and if you've been drinking long enough, you'll have a seizure. And that whole complex of things is called the DTs, which is a fancy word for alcohol withdrawal. And so if you're using alcohol on a regular basis and you stop, there is a predictable pattern of withdrawal. I can tell you pretty much what you're going to feel like in 12 hours and 24 and 48. Therefore, alcohol is addictive. If you're using heroin on a regular basis and we take the heroin away, pretty soon your eyes are going to run, your nose is going to run, your guts are going to ache. If any of you have done it, you know what I'm talking about. And it's a predictable pattern of withdrawal. I can tell you pretty much what you're going to feel like tomorrow and the next day, therefore, heroin's addictive. If you're using cocaine and we take it away from you, you just sit there and look at us. It's not that you don't feel anything when you stop using cocaine, but there's no predictable pattern of withdrawal. And we used to say, because there's no withdrawal, it's not addictive. We recognize today that drugs that are addictive frequently, but don't always have withdrawal, and drugs that produce withdrawal frequently, but not always are addictive. If any of you have been on antidepressants and forgot to take them for a couple of days, you experienced withdrawal, you know, tingling in your fingers and spinning in your head but antidepressants are not addictive. So withdrawal and addiction often, but don't always go together. But we didn't understand that. So it's 1975, it's Saturday night, and five guys go out to the discotheque because that's where you went in 1975. None of you are old enough to remember that anymore. To try this cocaine stuff that they've heard so much about. And they had a great time. Uh, and it was just as good as people had told them it was. But you know, before long, one of them was doing it on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And before long, the guy, they were lawyers. So the guy said, what's brown and black and looks good on a lawyer? A pit bull. So they were, they were all lawyers on Saturday night. And before long, the guys at the law firm were saying, you know, you don't stop sticking that shit up your nose, you're gonna get fired. And before long, he was fired. And before long, the wife said, you don't stop doing that, we're leaving. In fact, we're staying, you're leaving. And before long, he was living out of the car, and before long, he had traded that for cocaine. And it forced us to look at the question of addiction differently. Up until that point, the major drug of addiction had been alcohol. Alcohol takes you down slowly. We had gotten used to you always being like that. We wrote alcoholics off as weak-willed, immoral, degenerate bums, hopeless, helpless, useless, don't waste your time on them. This forced us to look at addiction differently. Here was a guy who six months ago was not a weak-willed, immoral, degenerate, well, he was a lawyer, he was a little immoral, but he wasn't a weak-willed, degenerate bum. He got up every day at six o'clock, went to the gym every day, worked hard. By Western definitions of success, he was successful. Big house, couple of cars in the driveway, educated, yet here he was hopelessly addicted to cocaine. What's going on? It didn't make sense. It didn't fit our model. Well, the first thing we realize is that cocaine is addictive. That seems like a really silly thing today. That's not news today. We know that very well. It's very addictive. But if cocaine is so darned addictive, how come five of them went out and played with it and only one of them got in trouble? I don't know. You know, and so it got the wheels turning. It got us thinking that there's something going on here that we're missing. And so there have kind of been two schools of thought. We have known forever that alcoholism runs in families. Okay. Plato, the Greek dude, long, long time ago, said that drunken and harebrained women beget drunken and harebrained children. So the ancient Greeks knew that alcoholic mums had alcoholic kids. They knew that dumb mums had dumb kids, but that's not our issue today. So for a long, long time, we've known alcoholism runs in families. But up until recently, there was a tendency to say, well, it runs in families because when you grow up in an alcoholic household, it's traumatic. It's not very good, right? It's pretty dysfunctional. Your parents are drunk all the time. They do not 
even though they may do the best job they can, they do not teach you all of the things that you need to know as an adult to cope with the inevitable stresses and trials that happen in life. And so you have this traumatic dysfunctional upbringing and when you're an adult and the inevitable stress has happened, uh, you do the only thing your parents taught you how to do, which is get drunk. And, you know, it kind of makes a little bit of sense, but it's also like saying diabetes runs in families because you watched your mother take insulin and you thought it would be a good idea. It doesn't make so much sense. So we know that alcoholism and addiction runs in families. There's no question about that. No one argues that. The argument is, does it run in families because of what you experience when you're growing up, all that trauma, or does it run in families because it's got something to do with genetics? That's a tough question to answer. How much of who you are today as a person is due to that DNA that your parents gave you on Saturday night? And how much of who you are today as a person is due to everything that's happened to you to this point? Do you like to get up early in the morning or do you like to stay up late at night? At the buffet, do you like chicken or steak? What makes you laugh? You know, eye color, that's genetic, that's easy. Hair color, that's genetic. But the rest of it is really tough to figure out. And most of us grow up with our parents. So at the end of the day, how much of who I am is the DNA and how much of who I am is everything they've taught me? But some kids don't. Kids that don't grow up with their parents are adopted. adopted. So kids that get adopted out early in life give us a really unique opportunity to separate the DNA that those two people gave you and the life experience that these two people gave you. Because most of us can't separate that. Well, nowadays we have birth control and Planned Parenthood and terminations and all kinds of things. There are no more orphanages and there are very few adopted kids. But that's pretty new. That's only in the last 50 years or so. In 1945, the Second World War ended. None of us remember that. But it ended in 1945. During the Second World War, there were some 55 million people killed. That's a lot of people. And then, as in now, most of the casualties were civilians, not soldiers. And at the end of the war, there were a lot of orphans. And we were desperate to find homes for these kids. There was no food, there was no housing. We had to find places to put these kids. And if you wanted one, you got one. And if you wanted 10, that's even better. Here's 10. And there were no home studies or anything like that. We were just desperate to do something. Someone in the 1970s got the bright idea to go back and look at these kids that were adopted out right after the war, who are now adults, and try and figure out something about the rate of alcoholism. And so they divided them into two groups. Those whose real parents, dead and gone in the war, had no alcoholism or those whose real parents killed in the war had alcohol history. And they got adopted. And they were either adopted out into a non-alcoholic family, families in which there was no active alcoholism going on while they grew up, or they got a little unlucky and they were adopted out into an actively alcoholic family, family in which there was drinking going on while they were growing up. It's 30 years later, they're all in their 30s or even early 40s, and we take a look at these kids and we say, what's the rate of addiction? So if we look at the kids that came from non-addicted parents, their DNA donors didn't have any addiction, and they were raised in a so-called normal household with no addiction. Their rate of addiction when they grew up was under 5% or less than one in 20. It was probably less than that, but everyone that was under 5% got stuck in that category. 1%, 2%, 3%, they're all in that group. If you look at the kids that came from non-addicted parents, DNA donors weren't addicts, but they were raised in an alcoholic household. So they didn't come from addiction, but they grew up in addiction. They experienced all that dysfunction. Their rate of addiction when they grew up unchanged, less than one in 20 of them grew up to have an addiction. And so if your parents weren't addicts, it didn't seem to make much difference whether you grew up in a so-called normal household or a dysfunctional one. If you look at the kids that came from addicted parents, 
dead and gone in the war, didn't even know them, and were raised in non-addicted families. So they came from addiction, but they grew up in what was considered a perfectly normal house. Their rate of addiction when they grew up was 40%, or about eight out of 20 of them grew up to have an addiction. And if you look at the kids that came from addicted parents and were twice unlucky, they got adopted out by other addicts or alcoholics, unchanged, 40%, or about eight out of 20. And so what this showed us, among many other studies, is that genetics have a lot to do with your chances of getting addicted. So let's look at twins. Two kinds of twins, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, close, close, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they're all paternal. <laughs> paternal and identical. So if you're a woman in this room and you're in your reproductive years, about once a month you have a cycle. And what happened about two weeks before your period started was that one of your ovaries released an egg. And if that egg bumps into a sperm in the next 72 hours, you get pregnant and you go on to have a baby in nine months. And if that egg does not bump into a sperm in the next 72 hours, it dies and you go on to have a period and repeat the cycle next month. And you have two ovaries, a right and a left. And they usually take turns, January, February, March, April. But some women, there's a familial, a genetic tendency for some women to have double barrel shotguns and they fire two eggs off at a time. And if you fire two eggs off, there are literally millions and millions of sperm. They will likely both get fertilized. And nine months later, you will have two babies, not one. And we call those twins. But those are fraternal twins. They come from two different egg, two different sperm. They're so different that one could be a boy and one could be a girl. We give them similar names like James and Jennifer and we dress them the same and we call them twins, but really they are no more closely related to each other than they are to their brother or sister born two years earlier. Because they're all from different sperm and different eggs. So they're just brothers and sisters, sister and sister, but they're kind of special because they're twins and they have the same birthday. The other kind of twin is identical, and this is a little stranger. So you start off with one egg fertilized by one sperm, and it should go on to form one people. But something strange happens that we don't quite understand very early in the development process, and it kind of clones itself, and we end up with two people. But these two people come from the same egg and the same sperm. They are genetically identical. They cannot be boy and girl, okay? They're both boys, they're both girls, they both have blue eyes, they both have blonde hair, they're both left-handed, they're both whatever, because they have the same DNA. As life goes on, as they grow up, different things happen to them and they start to look a little bit different, but like in grade one, you can't tell them apart. You know, they're just identical. So I said, okay. Two types of twins, we understand that. So we went into large treatment centers in the United States where in rooms like this, there are literally hundreds of people. And we say, how many in this room have a twin? And the odd hand would go up. And we say, now just fraternal twins. I don't want any identical twins. And of course, most of the hands would stay up. If your fraternal twin is in a treatment center with addiction and we track the twin down in the community, we track you down in the community, wherever you're living, what do you think the chances are that the twin, the fraternal twin, also has an addictive disorder? 20%. Meh, 40%. Okay? Now, remember, these two are just brothers and sisters, right? Okay? So, if you are in here, and you are, the chances of your brother or sister having an addiction as well is roughly 40%. Okay, and look at your family. Some of you say, yeah, that's the average. Some of you may have three siblings and you're all addictive, it's 100%, and others will have three and it's none. So if you add it all together and divide it, you're gonna come up with a number that's just about 40% every time. If we go into the room and say, who in this room has a twin and the hands go up, we say, sorry, just identical twins. Very few hands stay up, but a few do. If we track the identical twin down in the community, what do you think the chances are that they're both boys? 100%. 100%. Both got blue eyes? 100%. 100%. Both addicts? 
95%. That's what you would think. Yeah, good guesses, all of them. The answer was 95%. So not quite all genetic, but a large genetic influence. We recognize today in a field called epigenetics that genes can be turned on and off. So, you know, it's only a few years ago in the 50s that we discovered DNA. I mean, we knew that there was genetics. We, I mean, you know, you breed cows, you can breed dogs. We knew that there was genetics and we understood that things were inherited, but we didn't understand the molecules. And in the 50s, we discovered DNA. And we said, ah, well, okay, now we know how it works. There's this DNA stuff and it codes for everything that's gonna happen to you. How smart you're gonna be, how tall you're gonna be, how fat you're gonna be, what color your eyes are, blah, 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 blah. And we used to call it the blueprint for life and we figured it was like construction drawings. You draw it on the paper and that's what the building's gonna look like in the end. We recognize that that's not entirely accurate today. The genes can be turned on and turned off and so there's a general plan, but genes can be turned on and off. So this is why it's not 100%. The environment does have a role. And the analogy will go back to the diabetes thing. You know, if one of your parents is diabetic, what's your chances of being diabetic? 40%, 40% exactly the same as this. Let's look at one family. So, oops, I need my different pen. There's a reason for my madness. In medical books, this is how we draw families, called a genogram. Not that it matters. And these people had 10 kids. And this is Patrick or Patty. And this is Sheila. And between the names and the color of the ink, where are they from? Ireland. The Irish are a wonderful population to study alcoholism in. As the old saying goes, what's rarer than a sober Irishman? Uh, if you understand that this is a genetically based illness, well, that's not truly a compliment. It's not an insult either. Are you surprised to see blonde Swedes? No. no. Are you surprised to see dark Italians? No. no. How come? Because up until just a couple of years ago, we didn't travel. There were no roads. Literally, there were no roads. There were no sidewalks. There were no trains, planes, or boats. Well, there were boats, but those were for pirates and merchants. People didn't go on a trip. Uh, and most of humanity, all of us, were far too poor to own a horse. We had enough trouble feeding ourselves, let alone a horse. And so our world was a few miles from where we were born. You were born in a little village, you grew up in your little village, and when it came time to marry, you married someone close by. Maybe one village over if you were real adventurous. Uh, and so genetics tended to concentrate. The Swedes are all blonde, the Italians are all dark, the Irish are all drunk. It's <laughs> the way it works. So Paddy is an alcoholic. He loves his Irish whiskey. He lives for payday because he can go down to the pub, pay his tab, and he knows he's good for two more weeks of drinking. Still found time to father 10 children. How many of those kids do you think will grow up to have an addiction? Four to 10. Four to 10 is a right answer, 40%. If you have one addicted parent, your chances of inheriting this disease are roughly 40%. Remember that these are averages. Some of you will say, I've got one addicted parent and there's only 10% of us that are addicted. But if you add it all up and put it together, you'll come up with 40%. Turns out, Sheila likes her Irish whiskey every, every bit as much as Patrick. Can damn near match him drink for drink, which might have something to do with why they had 10 kids. <laughs> How many of those kids do you think will grow up to be addicts or alcoholics? 80% is the answer, it's simple. If you have two addicted parents, your chances of inheriting this disease are about 80%. Uh, and if you look at your own family history, this will probably make sense. It's also important if you think about your kids, because in here, I presume, you are for the right reason, which means that you have the genetics to get addicted or you wouldn't be here. And so your children have or will have a minimum 40% chance. 
Addicts frequently hang with addicts, so there's a reasonably good chance that you will procreate with other addicted individuals. And so your children may indeed have that 80% chance. You can't change that. You can't change their eye color, you can't change their hair color, you can educate them. And I come back to diabetes, you know, if you and your partner were diabetic and one of you went blind and the other had your feet amputated from your diabetes, you might want to teach your kids about diabetes and the risks of not looking after themselves. Making sense so far? Okay, so by this point, we, know, we knew forever, the Greeks knew, we knew forever that alcoholism runs in families. Today we know that it runs in families because of genetics. Does poverty cause alcoholism? No. No. Alcoholism causes poverty. So if you look at postal codes, and all this information is available for Stats Canada, you know, they can tell you what the average income is in that postal code. Poor neighborhoods, rich neighborhoods, easy to understand. And if you look at the poor neighborhoods, the rate of alcoholism is indeed much higher. But that doesn't mean that living in a poor neighborhood makes you alcoholic. Being an alcoholic makes you live in a poor neighborhood. It's hard to get ahead financially when your addiction is running your life. Does trauma cause addiction? No, addiction causes trauma. If your parents are both addicted when they're raising you, chances are you're going to experience some trauma. And so if you look at individuals who suffer from addiction, they have a high rate of having experienced trauma. But if you understand that this is a genetic illness and the people that beget you and raised you were struggling with their own addictions, it's not surprising that you experienced trauma in your childhood. <coughs> So we're at the point where we understand that it runs in families. We understand that it's probably got to do with genetics and we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Why are some people at risk of addiction and other people seem to be not nearly as much at risk. And so we got some university students. University students are kind of poor. And you put an ad in the campus newspaper, wanted volunteers to study alcoholism, 100 bucks and free booze, they line up at the door. Uh, and they're old enough to sign a consent. And so this is what we did. And we carefully screened them. So you get into the study and we ask you lots and lots and lots of questions. And basically the questions have to do with two things. What's your family history? And so aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins twice removed, is there any addiction? No, then you're in this group, the non-addicted families. And over here we have all the Irish kids, so lots of addiction in their families. And so we know that if it's genetic and if there's a risk of inheriting it, the risk is probably higher in this group than it is in this group. Otherwise the two groups are the same. The same age distribution, the same number of boys, the same number of girls in each group. And most importantly, no one in this group who clearly already has their own addiction. Okay. We then take some vodka and label it with radiation. It sounds terrible, but it doesn't glow in the dark. When you go for a bone scan or a thyroid scan at the hospital, they will inject a little something that has a radioactive marker on it. Beep, beep, beep. And they'll inject it into you and they'll say, come back in a couple of hours. And when you come back in a couple of hours, they run a very sensitive Geiger counter over you and they see where that radiation has accumulated. We do it a lot for cancer and other things. We can do an alcohol scan. You can't go to the hospital and get an alcohol scan. This is a research tool, but it can be done. So we take some radio labeled alcohol that kind of sends a signal out telling us where it is. And we inject it, we mainline it, we intravenously give it to these kids. We give it to them intravenously because we don't want to worry about who had lunch, who had a hamburger, who had three hamburgers, how fast it was absorbed and all that stuff. And then we take a look at the brains. And so if I put my head here and I was to remove half my skull, it would look something like this. An artist, I'm not. So that's an eye, and that's a nose, that's your brain, and that's your spinal cord. You gotta use your imagination a little bit. That's not that bad. Okay, so we take radioactive labeled vodka. We inject it in these kids and we say, okay, let's see where it goes. We have fun doing this stuff. Okay, so we look at the kids that come from non-addicted families. And the alcohol is in the front of their brain, the back of their brain and a little bit up here. It's not really surprising. The front of your brain, the part that's behind your forehead is very creatively called your frontal lobes. 
And that's the part of your brain that controls inhibition and judgment. That's the part of your brain that says, don't pick your nose at the table, don't fart in group, and don't pat bums that you don't know very well. Okay, get drunk, you'll do all kinds of things you would never have done sober. And that's because alcohol tends to affect the judgment part of your brain more than other parts. The back of the brain is what controls fine motor coordination, and so before they had those roadside screening devices, the police would say, you've been drinking, you say, no, sir. And they said, well, get out, walk a straight line, one foot in front of the other, and touch your nose at the same time, okay? If you've been drinking, that's very hard to do, because the part of your brain that lets you do that is affected by alcohol and so your fine coordination is off. Nowadays, you just blow in the machine. No big surprises. So we took the radioactive labeled alcohol and we injected it into the brains of kids that genetically speaking, were at high risk of addiction. And a number of them had alcohol here and here and here, same thing. But there was an area down here that was glowing with radiation in these kids that wasn't in these. It's like, uh-huh. They go out to a campus party on Saturday night, they look the same, they smell the same, they act the same, but deep inside their brain is something different going on. So it's like, ah, we're beginning to figure this out. And so what are we talking about? Well, if you put a finger between your eyes and you put another finger in front of your ear, and you imagine where those two lines would meet inside your skull, that's kind of what we're talking about. Oh, we're all behind the soft part of your palate. Uh, it's the pleasure center, the addiction center, mood center, whatever you want to call it. It has a lot of basic functions. We come into this world, I used to say like computers. Now I say we come into this world a bit like a smartphone. Okay, you go, go to the store and buy yourself a new iPhone or whatever, turn it on, it does a whole bunch of stuff. But you know, if you want it to be your phone and to be useful to you, you download a bunch of apps because these are the things you like to do. We're born a little bit the same way. You know, we, we come pre-programmed with a number of things. You don't have to teach a baby to cry or eat or pee. They know how to do all that. They got to learn to talk and walk and get some manners and do all these things. Okay, so how do we learn these things? Like, how does that happen? Why do we learn it? You know, why can you teach your dog not to pee in the house? How does that happen? You know, you can't speak to him. What's going on? So that's where this center comes in. We have this pleasure center, this emotional control center deep inside our brain. So it's Saturday night, it's November. You lost your license for the second time. You're walking. You're at your friends playing poker or doing whatever. It's midnight, it's time to go home. If you walk home, and you have to walk home because you've lost your license too many times, it's about two kilometers. But it's cold, it's windy, and it's raining a little bit. If you cut through the schoolyard and a little bit of woods in the graveyard, it's only about three quarters of a kilometer. Yeah, hell, I'll take the shortcut. It's late, I'm tired. And so you cut through the schoolyard fine and you get into the woods and about halfway through the wooded part, you hear a noise and then another noise and then kind of a growling sound. How do you feel? Scared. scared. You don't feel good, do you? So how come you feel scared? What's going on inside your brain to make you feel scared? Your brain is releasing a bunch of chemicals that are causing a negative emotional experience. Your brain is smarter than you are and it's saying, look, Turkey, you keep walking through the woods at midnight, you're gonna get us killed. <laughs> okay, so it's making it unpleasant so you don't do it again. We come into this world pre-programmed to do two things. Number one is survive. No, no, you don't survive, nothing matters. And so, you know, you know to breathe, you know to eat, you know to do this. You um, walk down the street at night, it's dark, you hear a loud noise, I defy you not to turn and look. You can't. You're pre-programmed to do that because a loud noise could represent danger, you'd better pay attention. Number two? Reproduce. Reproduce, exactly. If all you do is stay alive for 80 years, the game is over. So you're hardwired to eat and screw. Okay, and, and your brain works to get you to do that. 
And so you're walking through the woods, it's dark, you hear noises, you're probably not gonna stay alive. You're experiencing a negative emotion so you don't do it again. You're 13 years old at the high school dance and you're a guy and you ask a girl to dance and they laugh at you. How does it feel? Negative, terrible, you're embarrassed as heck. And your brain is flooding you with negative experiences saying you don't improve your pickup line, pick line, you ain't never gonna reproduce, okay? And so that's how your brain gets you to behave. But there's an opposite system to that. That's the negative system. Well, there's also a positive system. And so when my dog finally makes the connection that he's supposed to pee outside, and I tell him what a good dog he is, and I rub his head and I give him a treat, his brain is flooded with positive chemicals and he feels good. And we have the same system. Drugs of addiction. Everything that we get addicted to, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, I don't care what, has something in common. And what is that? Endorphin release? Yeah, that's a little too technical. You're close. But what do they all do? Make you feel good. Make you feel good. They change the way you feel. No one gets addicted to penicillin. It doesn't change the way you feel. All drugs that are addictive change the way you feel. If it doesn't change your mood, if it doesn't change you feel, the way you feel, if it's not mood altering, it's not addictive. Does LSD change the way you feel? Yeah. yeah, no, not really. So LSD is called mind altering and it's a funny distinction. But if I take a hit of acid and go for a walk and the trees walk with me, I might feel good. But if I go for a walk and the trees are trying to trip me, I'll probably feel bad. We never see anyone get addicted to LSD. It's not addictive, it is mind altering, not mood altering. I did not say that it was a good idea to use acid, okay? I didn't say that. I just said that it's not addictive because it's not mood altering. For something to be addictive, it has to be mood altering. Are other things addictive? Like? Gambling. Gambling. Sex. Sex. Tobacco. Tobacco's a drug, but that's true. Food. Food. Exercise. So there are behaviors that you can do that trigger this mood altering system. And if you have the appropriate ability, you'll get addicted. If we have time, we'll talk about that a little bit. So we have a positive system. I want you to imagine that it is 25,000 years ago. We only learned to farm about 10,000 years ago. So 25,000 years ago, we all lived as so-called hunters and gatherers, okay, day by day. There were no fridges, freezers, Safeways, or anything like that. We didn't know that you could grow plants. We hadn't figured that out yet. And we used to go out and get our food every day. And so it's 25,000 years ago, you get up in the morning, the sun is shining, the birds are singing, ah, what a nice day, let's go kill something and eat it. Okay, we're motivated to do things. We don't do boredom well. Because up until just a couple of years ago, we've been on this planet for about three and a half million years. Up until just a couple of years ago, we had to get off our butts and do something to survive every day. If we didn't, we died. And so we're motivated and that's still with us. I mean, a week on the beach, maybe two is fine, but we don't want to spend the rest of our life sitting on the beach. We get bored. We need to do things. And so today we clean the garage or paint the fence or do something like that. In the old days, you'd get up and the sun was shining and you'd go kill an antelope and you'd feel good. And you'd bring the antelope back to the camp, uh, the village, the whatever it is that you were living in 25,000 years ago and cook up the antelope and sit and visit around the fire and make jokes about Charlie almost falling off the cliff and stuff like that. And how do you feel? Good. You feel safe, you feel warm, you feel protected. And the reason you need to feel that is that we don't survive alone. We got no claws, we got no fangs, we do not survive. We're not like a moose or a bear, we can't live in the woods all by ourselves. Uh, we need each other to survive. And so as you sit around the fire, you're reinforcing your bonds. Chemicals are being released in your brain that are attaching to the sedative receptors. And when they attach, it causes the release of something called dopamine. The 
brain's feel-good chemical, and the brain is saying to you, this is good, do it again. You need these people to survive. Make them like you, you want to like them, I've got your back, you've got mine. When you went out in the morning, I forgot to add this, but when you went out in the morning and went hunting, your stimulant receptors had chemicals park on them, and the brain released dopamine, and again, your brain said, this is good, do it again. So you've had a successful hunt, you got a belly full of antelope, you're tired, it's time to go to bed, you crawl into your hut, cave, or whatever it is you were sleeping in 25,000 years ago, and your mate reaches over you and touches you in the way that you know what he or she is thinking, and you have sex. And how do you feel? Good. Good, you got that warm afterglow. Okay, and why you have the warm afterglow is a chemical called endorphins are released in your brain, park on these receptors, and cause the release of the very same dopamine. Your brain is saying, that was good, do it again. This promotes our survival, this promotes reproduction, you want to do this sort of stuff regularly. Drugs of addiction work because they hijack this natural survival system. This natural survival system that we all have, including my goldfish and my dog, uh, can be hijacked. Cocaine and amphetamines hijack it by attacking the stimulant receptors. And so when you do cocaine, it parks on these receptors, just like going out to hunt an antelope does, causes the release of dopamine, and your brain is tricked into saying, that was good, do it again. This is going to help us survive. If you do alcohol or benzos, they attack or attach rather to these receptors causing the release of dopamine and your brain is tricked into saying that was good, do it again. Opiates, things like heroin, fentanyl, attach on these receptors causing the same release of dopamine, fooling your brain into saying that was good, do it again. Make sense? Okay, so Everyone has these learning centers. My dog has one. All people have them. All creatures have them. How come they don't all get addicted? Because cocaine or heroin or alcohol will work on any brain. How come all brains don't get addicted? And this is kind of where we were. You know, so we kind of understand the part of the brain that's involved. We even understand the chemistry and why cocaine could fool your brain into thinking it was a good thing. But it can fool all brains. How come all brains don't get addicted? And so this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle. So in the 1980s, or 70s actually, way back, long time ago, we were looking at dead, late 70s, early 80s, looking at dead heroin addicts in New York City. And you know, we didn't have the technology that we have today. I mean, today we can do DNA mapping and sequencing and so many things that we couldn't do just a few years ago. And just a few years ago, if you wanted to study things, you took dead people and opened their skull, took their brain out, put it in a blender, and analyzed the chemicals that were in it. And so we had done this a number of times. And in the 80s, we did it with dead alcoholics, happened to be in Texas. And so if you die on the street as an alcoholic and no one claims your body, and by the time you've been living on the street for 20 years, no one claims your body, it could be given up for medical research in those days. We don't do this anymore. And after we were done, you'd be given a proper burial. And so we were taking the brains out of dead alcoholics, mashing them up in a blender, trying to understand something about alcoholism. And we found a chemical in the brains of these dead alcoholics called tetrahydroisoquinolone. It's a big long word. It's too long to say every time, so we abbreviate it to THIQ. The puzzle is much more complicated than this, but if you understand this, you understand the concept. And that's really what's important. So park that for a minute. The only other place that we had found this chemical was in dead heroin addicts in New York City about 10 years or five years earlier. And so the first thing we did was phone the chief of police and say, hey, all these alcoholics are using heroin. And of course he laughed, they couldn't afford a decent bottle of wine, let alone heroin. So we had stumbled across a chemical that was common to dead heroin addicts in New York City and dead alcoholics in Texas. Now we have to use our imagination a little bit. A long, long time ago, movies used to be black and white. 
and low budget. And a real simple way to make a low budget movie was knights and castles. And you know, a couple of horses and you put them different outfits on them and you paint them differently and a couple of sheets of plywood painted to look like rocks and pretty soon you had a set. And the plot was real simple. The guys in the castle didn't want you to get in and the guys on the outside wanted to get in. We thought it was great in the 60s. Um, it's much more, much more complicated now. And so you're outside the castle and you want to get in. You have no cannons, you have no guns, you have no artillery, you have spears, stones, and arrows. And you throw those at the castle and you can throw them at the castle till you're old and gray, you ain't getting in. Your kids are still throwing them, your grandkids are still throwing them and they haven't gotten in. You have to use your head and you had to invent something. And what did you invent? Catapult. Exactly. Okay, park that for a minute. Is alcohol addictive? Yeah? Is heroin addictive? Yeah. What's more addictive, heroin or alcohol? Okay. Heroin. Is cocaine addictive? Yes. What's more addictive, heroin or cocaine? Heroin. Cocaine. How do we know that? Well, it's not nice, but I'll tell you how we do it. We get Irish rats, okay? So rats, like people, have genetics. Okay, and you take a cage with a hundred laboratory white rats and in one corner of the cage you put water and in the other corner of the cage you put water with just a little bit of vodka. You will find that some of the rats like to hang around the vodka water and some of them hang around the water water. So you divide the cage in half. All you water water rats go do something else. You take the water, the rats that liked a bit of vodka and you put them in a new cage that has a little bit of vodka, a little bit more vodka. And you keep doing that until you find really vodka-loving Irish rats, okay? They have the genetics to get addicted. They get easily addicted. And a couple of generations later, you take their offspring, their children. Well, you don't call them children, but they're, they're rattlings. And you addict a group of them to alcohol. And the other group, you let them get addicted to heroin. And the other group, you let them get addicted to cocaine. Now comes the nasty part. And so the rats live in a cage, and over there is the bar where they get their vodka. And they have to walk along a little metal bridge to get to the bar. And they go to the bar, and they have their drinks, and they come back home, and they do it just like we do. But we get nasty. We electrify the bridge. We put an electric current on the bridge. And we see how much electricity the rats will put up with to go to the bar. So a little shock, they go to the bar. A little more shock. They go to the bar, but just barely. And you turn the electricity high enough up, the rats will say, forget it, it's not worth it, I'm not going to the bar. Okay, it's too much pain. Rats that were addicted to heroin, you needed to use more electricity. It took a higher voltage to stop the heroin rats than it did the alcohol rats. And therefore, we say the rats that are addicted to heroin are willing to put up with more pain to get their drug than the alcohol rats. Therefore, heroin is more addictive. The cocaine rats were all electrocuted. We couldn't raise the voltage high enough to stop them. They would kill themselves before they would stop. And so on that basis, we say that clearly cocaine, I mean, the heroin rats wouldn't kill themselves. The alcohol rats wouldn't even put up with a lot of pain, yet the cocaine rats would electrocute themselves. And so we know that these drugs have different levels of addiction. Okay, I want you to imagine, we've really got to use our imagination here, but it works. At the end, it'll make sense. This is the pleasure center, the emotion center, the thing that we talked about in your brain, finger in front of your ear and between your eyes, the thing deep inside your brain. And it has those receptors that we talk about, a place for stimulants to park, a place for sedatives to park, and a place for opiates to park, because that's all part of good survival. And they're all on there. Now I want you to imagine that this is covered with three feet of cement. Cement igloo. Most of you don't have cement in your head. A few of you, I wonder. But imagine that this is covered with three feet of cement, a steel reinforced igloo of cement. Every time you get drunk, you take an alcohol rock about that size and you throw it at the wall. But it's a steel reinforced, three foot thick concrete wall. You ain't never going to break it. Okay? And every time you use heroin, you pick up a bigger rock and you throw it at the wall. But it's a three foot thick steel reinforced concrete wall. You still ain't never going to break it. And every time you use cocaine, you pick up a really big rock, no pun intended, and you throw it at the wall. 
<laughs> it's still a three foot thick steel reinforced concrete wall. You ain't never going to break it. And that's kind of what happens in normal people. If you are born with a genetic predisposition to addiction, you are born with THIQ. And THIQ, although only a small part of the puzzle, is like a catapult. And so you surround the castle, you want to get in and you bring your catapult up and you don't put anything in it. You just keep firing the catapult. What happens? Nothing. Nothing. And the guys over there are throwing the rocks at the castle by hand. What happens? Nothing. Put the two together and magic happens. And so if you have the genetic predisposition to get addicted, every time you get drunk, you take an alcohol-sized rock and put it in the catapult and fire it at the wall. But now the rock's hitting kind of hard, zing, and bit by bit, that three foot thick steel reinforced concrete wall will begin to chip and crack and break. And for most people, it probably takes about 20 years from first drunk to hopeless addiction. If your drug of choice happens to be heroin, you put a much bigger rock in the catapult and fire it at the wall. Not surprisingly, the wall breaks more quickly. It takes about two years. And if your drug of choice happens to be cocaine, you put a really big rock in the catapult and fire it at the wall, and cocaine will do to your wall in six months what alcohol takes 20 years to do. But it does exactly the same thing. Once that wall breaks, that process gets set up called obsession, compulsion, and craving. Most of you can probably remember a time in your life when you could drink or use, take it or leave it, you know, you were normal. But it changed. Can't tell you what day it changed, what week, what month, I'm not even sure what year it changed. But you go from using because you want to, to using because you have to. You can't stop, you can't control it. And that's when the wall broke. Once the wall breaks, that process of obsession, compulsion and craving gets set up. And once the wall breaks, it never grows back. AA says once a cucumber becomes a pickle, it don't ever become a cucumber again. You have one addiction center and one wall, the wall never grows back. And even if you broke your wall with alcohol and nothing else, uh, you don't have two years of heroin and six months of cocaine in you because that one wall is broken. You're addicted to drugs you haven't even tried yet. Uh, because you've set yourself up. And we'll come back to diabetes. You know, you don't look after yourself very well. You had diabetic parents. You didn't pay attention. You got diabetes. And you end up in the hospital. And we talk to you and ask you lots of questions. And we find out you've been eating 12 donuts a day. You can't eat 12 donuts a day if you got diabetes. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're going to die young. You're going to go blind. All, all kinds of horrible things are going to happen to you. You say, OK, doc, I got that. I'll switch to cookies. You know, it doesn't make sense. Once the diabetes is set up, you're a sitting duck for cookies, candies, uh, donuts, cake, whatever. And once an addiction gets set up, you're set up for all the drugs, even things you haven't tried yet. Does that make sense? Yep. So how come some people like cocaine and some people like alcohol? Some people like both. And some people like everything. <laughs> Garbage junkies. Anything will do. <laughs> And there are such people, so let me help you understand this and then we'll wrap up. So, where does addiction happen? Deep inside your brain, that pleasure center. Why is it there? Stay alive and reproduce. Okay, it's your, it's your driving center. It was what tells you whether what you've just done is good, bad, or neutral. Okay, it's a, it's a very strong force in your life. It guides m far more things than you realize. And it has receptors. And we talked about how it has stimulant receptors where cocaine can trick us and park on it. It has sedative receptors where alcohol can park. And it has endorphin receptors where things like heroin and fentanyl can park. And that's kind of how we're made. But you know, some people, we all have 10 fingers. Hopefully you still got them. Uh, we all have 10 fingers. These ones can't play the piano worth a damn. I don't know, maybe yours can. So we're the same, but we're different. And we all have these receptors. But you know, some people might be born with a lot of these receptors. 
And if they use a drug like cocaine, there are many places for that drug to park. And every time it parks, it releases a little bit of dopamine. And they're going to release a lot of dopamine. And their brain is going to say, damn, that was good. Do it again. If you're an individual that is born with very few receptors, what happens? Well, you try some cocaine. It parks on your brain. It releases a bit of dopamine. You say, meh, not bad. What's the rest of the cocaine do? Else. Yeah, it's like Walmart on the 23rd of December. The official draw shopping day of us guys, we go to our favorite boutique, Walmart. And what's the parking lot like? <laughs> Pack, because every other guy is in there doing the same thing. And is there anywhere to park? No, what do you do? Drive around, you can't go home. Christmas is in a day and a half. I got to shop, okay? So you drive around waiting for someone to leave. And that's exactly what the cocaine does. It just floats around waiting for the, one of those spots to become empty. And you've been driving around the parking lot for 20 minutes. What do you do? Well, you park where you're not supposed to. You park in front of the dumpster. You park in the pregnant lady spot. You park in the handicapped spot. You park somewhere you're not supposed to. And that's exactly what the cocaine does. And when the cocaine parks where it's not supposed to, you see cops in the bushes and all kinds of uncomfortable things like that. And so that brain says, yeah, it was all right, but I didn't really like it. It made me uncomfortable. And so that individual is not likely to be liking cocaine. And other brains can have lots of sedative receptors, they'll really like alcohol, or lots of opiate receptors, they'll really like opiates. And this is why we all have those receptors, but we don't have exactly the same number. Make sense? Okay. Can you get addicted to other things? Yes. yes. What did we talk about earlier? Sex, exercise. Yeah, so how do those things work? How do you get addicted to those? Exactly the same way. So, if I give my dog some food, how does he eat? Anyone got a dog? Gobble. No one's got a dog? Gobbles. Gobbles. Why does he gobble? That's right. There might be another dog coming just around the corner that's going to eat his food. It's an evolutionary advantage. You know, dogs like us lived in the wild just a little while ago. And kibbles and bits didn't exist for them either. And when they came across some food, perhaps there was a bigger dog or a lion or something that was going to come and get this food, I'd better eat it as quickly as possible. Because I don't know how long I have to enjoy this meal. We're not a heck of a lot different. A few years ago, we lived in the woods, and when we came across some food, we best eat it as quickly as possible and as much as possible, because maybe we're gonna get chased off by a lion too. And so you have a stomach, and as your stomach stretches, it releases a chemical, and that chemical calls endorphin. And if it sounds a little familiar, it's because it parks on these heroin receptors. And so you eat a big turkey dinner, and oh, you're stuffed, and it almost hurts, but man, it somehow feels good. <laughs> we do it again. We all have that, because up until just a couple of years ago, we had to eat. And we had to eat quickly, and sometimes we had to eat a lot, because it might not be food for two or three days. Some of us have a really strong system. We all release endorphin when we overeat. But some of us release a lot of endorphin. And if you release a lot of endorphin, you get a much stronger dopamine response, and you're at risk of getting addicted to food. It's exactly the same process as heroin going on inside your brain, exactly. What else is addictive? Sex. Sex. So sex works exactly on the same spot. So you have sex, you have an orgasm, you roll over, and how do you feel? Good, great, yeah, you got that warm afterglow, all is right with the world, you know, and that's a good thing because Mother Nature wants to program you to do that often. If you don't do that often, you won't reproduce. If you don't reproduce, we're not going to be successful as a species. And so that's a positive behavior. We all have that response, but we don't all have it the same. Some people get a really big hit of endorphin, and it's far more rewarding for them than it is for the average, and they can get addicted to sex. What else can we get addicted to? Gambling. And so what's it like in casino? Is it kind of a relaxing, mellow environment? No. no. No windows, no clocks, lots of lights, bing, 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 lots of noise. It's very stimulating. And not surprisingly, it's designed 
to pleasure your stimulant receptors. And if you have a lot of stimulant receptors and you have an exaggerated response to that stimulation, you'll release a lot of chemical that in turn will release a lot of dopamine. And you say, this is great, I gotta come here more often. Okay. All of those things work the same way. They cause exactly the same mood altering response in your brain as heroin or cocaine or alcohol. What's going on is exactly the same. Not all of us have the physiology to release enough chemical to get addicted. Most of us only release a little bit of chemical and therefore it doesn't matter how often we go to the casino, it just doesn't do it for us. But if in your recovery you find that you get addicted to certain behaviors, whether it's sex, food, or gambling are the three most common ones, recognize that it's exactly the same thing. It's just like a drug. The food really isn't the drug, but it's the trigger that causes your brain to produce too much of the good chemical and so you want to be careful the neat thing is that treatment is the same whether your addiction is food cocaine sex or gambling treatment is the same hopefully now you will understand why some people get addicted and most people don't um, a lot of times addiction comes with a fair amount of guilt and shame like you've done something wrong how did I bring this upon myself that's no more justified than feeling guilty about being a diabetic. You know, yeah, I eat too many donuts, but who doesn't eat too many donuts? Um, any questions on all that stuff that we've covered? Clear as mud? Yeah. All right, for those of you suffering from terminally low nicotine, you get a smoke break. <laughs> Thank you.